The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is a good friend of mine, geologist, oil expert, and with oil headed over $110 a barrel. He is the best person that I can think of to talk to right now. So Art Berman, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show, my friend. Hey, George, thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, so you've got a chart deck that we're going to go through it's so so people can hopefully get their mind around what is happening, not just with the price of oil right now, but really maybe more importantly, the supply demand dynamics. Is, is, that, a, is that what your chart deck is dealing with here mostly? Yeah, what I'm trying to do, George, is to try to help people understand what the hell is going on in the world right now. And I don't mean politics and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but energy prices. And as you know, and we've discussed many times before, I mean, energy is the economy, at least that's, right. that's what I believe. And, and if you want to understand what's happening in the world, you need to understand the economy. And if you want to understand the economy, you better understand energy, which Today means oil. So, right. so the my belief, um, I, I, I show a, a quote here from my uh, colleague Jim Kunstler, um, who says that we're we're in the midst of a long emergency. Okay, the I think he probably said this back in 2008 or 2009, and it really hasn't changed. And and this long emergency is that we have been kind of denying the fact that we have any problem with our fuel supply uh, and he's talking fossil fuels there which include oil natural gas and coal right. and the point he's making is that that we are so dependent on these things that any slight disruption in supply or demand creates unbelievable uh, chaos in the economy and the world and there's just really no possibility that alternative energies renewables or whatever are going to solve the problem that that that's his belief and i'm not endorsing it except that you know kind of in a general way i think that describes what's happening right now and so so we got a situation in the world and we've we've had it for you know for at least six months where we're we're short of everything we got supply chain problems can't get what you want can't get what you need and the explanation that we get from our talking heads and the in the media and the politicians as well. It's just, it's just, you know, we're recovering from the pandemic. And, you know, once we get everything back in, you know, back into order with supply and demand, everything's going to be fine. And, and I, I sure hope they're right. But uh, my data says, no, we're not going to be fine. And, and we worry a lot about inflation. And we've got economists that dream up all sorts of, you know, esoteric explanations. And I'll show you some charts that you and, you know, your viewers decide if I'm, you know, smoking something or if that makes sense. You mentioned when we started. You're you know, definitely yeah. smoking something, Art, because you've got a rebel capitalist t-shirt on. Hey, man, I'm, I'm all in, George. <laughs> <laughs> oil prices as you said i mean they're you know they're above 110 dollars today um that's a, like a seven-year high natural gas and coal prices are even worse uh not in terms of dollars but you know as a percentage of increase and part of the reason we're here is you know got a lot of good and well-intentioned people trying to get us off of fossil energy and they don't get that we can't do it uh, that's making things worse and this just isn't going to get any better. So, you know, I think it's time to, to adjust, relax and say, this is the world going forward. And I'll tell you kind of at the end that, you know, part of accepting reality in my worldview is, you know, this belief that climate change is somehow due to natural causes or, or it's a hoax that's, you know, been concocted by, you know, academics looking for funding and, I mean, you know, everything is manipulated in the world, but to me, that 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 whole belief system just complicates our need to just address reality as it is. So uh, I'll leave that where it is. I showed this slide in June. I'm going to show it again. Welcome to the energy transition. When you want to change from fossil energy to something else, you end up with chaos. 
price. And that's what we got. This is European natural gas price. And I mean, you don't have to be a statistician to see that, you know, we were like at $6.50 per million BTUs in December. And, you know, we got up to 60 bucks in December and uh, we're up to almost 40 right now, kind of as a result of the Ukraine invasion. But I mean, the average price has, you know, pretty much gone up almost five times since the end of 2020. So, you know, the origins of all this are complicated, but the basic reason is, is that some people decided, oh, well, we can just get rid of oil and gas and nuclear and, you know, and, and coal, and we'll be fine with renewables. And guess what? Uh, that, is, that just didn't work. Uh, coal, look at that, man. I mean, you know, this is global coal. And I mean, we're at $321 per metric ton. And just a few months ago, we were at 100. Now, a lot of that's Ukraine, Russia, and all that. But the average over, you know, since September has been 200 compared to the average in 2020, end of 2020, which is about 70. Uh, I'm just going to briefly say that China is important always important. And China's been trying to do a whole lot of stuff with power rationing and trying to clean up the air there. And, and so they've been, they, they've created a sort of an artificial power shortage. They've stopped importing coal from Australia, which, you know, somebody needs to explain why we did that. They did that. But the bottom line is, is, is that the Chinese economy has taken a big hit because it's operating at a lower level of activity because they don't have enough gas, they don't have enough coal, and the government's imposing all sorts of, you know, crazy kinds of restrictions on the people that make those things. Not going to talk much about Evergrande, but, you know, this slide just shows that, you know, China's been building cities that no one lives in now for about 10 years, and it's coming home to them, and the government's not doing anything about it. And I'm not saying the government should, but you know, you got to, I mean, Evergrande is just this humongous company that is in default right now. The, you know, the shadow credit system is trying to absorb the debt. But I mean, 10% of China's GDP is in real estate that, you know, probably nobody needs developments and buildings. And you're more of an expert on this than I am, George. But you know, if Evergrande continues to go down, I mean, the deflationary repercussions around the world are huge. Supply chain problems. This is the Port of Los Angeles, and we don't hear much about it anymore because we've got bigger things to worry about. But it hasn't gotten very much better since it was all over the news. So, you know, we still got, you know, like 64,000 empty ships that are just sitting around there because they can't go back to anywhere. Better than 90,000. We got 69 ships waiting to get in as opposed to 109 a few months ago. But, you know, you could say it's better, but it, it sure isn't solved and it isn't going to get solved. Right. Container shipping. I mean, my God, I mean, the cost of shipping anything around the world has gone up fourfold. And then there's Ukraine. And I'll slow down here just a second. Europe gets 40 percent of its natural gas and 25 percent of its oil from Russia right now. And that is a big problem today. Right now, the cap at the, 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 the value of the four Russian energy companies is down 95%. 95%. Okay. Uh, now, some of that is just, you know, freezing stock markets and all of that. But um, this is a huge part. Nobody's buying Russian oil, right? And the reason that oil is 110 or 111 today is because Russia is the second largest oil supplier in the world. And today, I mean, we don't have a shortage, but today nobody's buying Russian oil. So 10 million barrels a day, where where's it going to come from? We don't know. Um, another thing that most people, many people don't understand is that 25% of the world's grain comes from Russia and Ukraine. So... You know, whatever's going on between those guys, it, it doesn't look good for, you know, for bread supply for the world. Uh, lots of things happening there. You know, BP says it's getting out of Rosneft. I'm not sure how they, 
you know, Rosneft is a big oil company in Russia. I don't know how they do that. You know, Norway's saying they're going to kick Russia out of their sovereign wealth fund. I, I, I don't know how all that works. But, you know, right now things are just not looking too good in that part of the world. So here's oil prices. This is Brent. This is the international price of oil. And it's increased fivefold since, you know, April of 2020. Of course, that was, you know, rock bottom for all time. But still, I mean, it's, you know, as of yesterday, futures were $105. And prices have increased 50% just this year. And this year's, you know, we're just in the third month. So uh, that's a big deal. This is, you know, a little bit of a complicated graph for, you know, for some people that don't follow the oil business. So let me just cut to the chase here. This is this is the supply balance of, of oil and oil in the world. The, the blue bars mean we got more than we need and the red bars mean we don't have enough. And what you see is that the red bars down here in the last three quarters of 21 were the lowest, the, the most negative, and the largest sustained deficit of oil that we've ever had since mm. we've been keeping track of this stuff. So it's, you know, it, it's getting a little bit better, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, you know, this is sort of a historic uh, level of we don't have enough oil in the world. It looks like you've got 2018 Iran sanction rally. Uh, yeah. So this is when we were in a deficit. I would assume this is directly a result of saying we're not going to buy Iranian oil when they're a major producer. So are we just seeing like Iranian sanction 2.0 here with Russia? So we should expect the same result? Well, we've already seen the same result. And, and, yeah. and yes, and, 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 and the problem and, and the similarity, I guess, in both cases was that here is you know, where I've got the Iran sanction rally, the deficit of supply preceded the sanctions. Uh -huh. So when we decided to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal and sanction their exports, we were adding fuel to a fire that was already burning. We're doing the exact same thing right now. I mean, obviously, we didn't ask Russia to invade Ukraine, but you, you get the similarity. So but it we looks started like off in, in a bad place. And then something artificial or political happens, it's just making it a whole lot worse. Yeah, but it looks like we're starting off in a worse place now. It oh, looks like we the, are. The, yeah. Yeah, the supply deficit's more extreme and the price was higher prior to this invasion. Therefore, if we do the sanctions, um, I, I guess we shouldn't expect the exact same thing. We should expect something worse because we're starting from worse position. We're starting from a worse position in terms of the magnitude of the deficit and got a whole lot of red bars that are converging right around now. Yeah. And you just had two, which wasn't great, but it was just two back in 2017, 2018. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, I, this this just sort of focuses on on the, the near term. It's 2021, 22. Of course, 22 is largely a projection. Uh, the gold means we're in deficit and the blue means we're in surplus. So you can pretty much wipe off the surplus from, from this chart as, as a rounding error. Uh, supply is in green, demand is in brown. Um, doesn't take a genius to say, well, it was bad in 21, but it's getting better. Well, it's getting better because price is high. And so, you know, we're going to make a last ditch effort to produce whatever we got left. And then in the fourth quarter, it gets almost just as bad as it was last year. And again, you know, these are going to be wrong because they're just somebody's forecast, but notionally, they're correct. So the point is, things may seem to get a little bit better, but they're still bad and they're going to stay a lot worse. This is a chart that shows where somebody, this is the U.S. Department of Energy, thinks that new production is going to come from, and you can see that 38% of it in the title comes from Russia. That ain't happening. <laughs> so already we're, we're, we're in trouble. 26% from OPEC. So, you know, th this is just, these are sort of the, 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 su the usual suspects that have a little bit more to produce, and, 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 and they, they will. I mean, with oil at $100 a barrel, just about everybody's going to produce what they can. But, you know, let's zoom back. And this is 
the world's oil supply by who matters since 2000. And the, the most important and the only important thing you really need to see on this chart is this bold dashed black line. Right. We reached a plateau. The world simply couldn't produce any more oil. This is crude oil and condensate in this chart, if anybody cares. It's not, you know, gasoline and diesel and all of that. But, it's, you know, it'd be the same chart, just higher if it were. We reached a point in 2005 to 2011 where we just couldn't seem to get off of this plateau of about 73 million barrels a day. And that's because we were focused on giant fields. You find a giant field, it would take seven or eight years to bring it online. By the time we did, a whole bunch of other fields would have depleted and we'd have a net gain of zero. And the result was that oil prices went up a whole lot. If you remember in 2008, we were like at $140 a barrel. Yep. 2011, 12, 13, 14, we were well over $100 a barrel. And then the US in blue with our shale kind of came to the rescue. We produced a ton of, of growth in oil and prices collapsed. They got real low in 2014. So the point of all this, this giant, you know, like fault line right here, that's 2020. That's what happened when COVID uh, stopped everything, economic activity, demand for oil, production of oil. And we've kind of climbed back up above that 2005 to 11 plateau, but we're still way short of where we were at the end of 2018. So demand is pretty much back to where it was. Supply is lagging by 6 million barrels uh, a day or so. And importantly, the rest of the world, everybody other than, you know, these usual suspects in red down here, the rest of the world, their incremental oil production, their growth is like the lowest it's ever been. And the rest of the world is a big number. I mean, it's everybody except the, you know, the 10 or 15 big producers. So, you know, just look at for a minute at the U.S. since we saved the world supply back in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. You know, this is all of our shale production called tight oil. And what you see is that the Permian Basin out in West Texas and New Mexico absolutely crushes all the other contributors, you know, the Bakken in North Dakota, the Eagle Ford in South Texas, et cetera, et cetera. And then, but looking at the well performance of all of those, we call them plays aggregated, what you see just looking at the, the wells that have been completed, the new wells that have been added in 2021 and comparing them to the ones that were added before the pandemic, the rates that they're coming on at are about 22% lower than mm. before the pandemic. So we're getting less than 100 barrels a day per average well versus 125 almost previous. So, right. you know, that's that's concerning. Um, it, it says that, you know, it says something. For some reason, the wells aren't as good. So I went in and did a, a bunch of detailed work like scientists like to do. And I actually looked at an important part of the Permian Basin where Pioneer Natural Resources and a bunch of other guys are, are working. And I actually ran out the, the reserves. How much does, is each well going to produce that started its production in 2018 versus 2020? So this gold, this orange curve is... 2018, so the, it, an average well starts here at 40,000 barrels a month and declines until it is no longer commercial. Right. The blue is, is the average 2020 well. So it's starting out lower, less than 35,000 barrels a month. And the red line is the cumulative difference. Mm -hmm. So a well that started production in 2020 is going to be about 27% poorer in terms of the total reserves that it delivers right. than a well that started in 2018. That's even worse <laughs> than, the, that, than the problem in, in, in rates. So what that says is, yeah, we got, we got oil companies saying, hey, you know, investors, you've been telling us you want more returns. 
we're not going to grow like we did. That's all well and good, and they do have a lot of cash flow, free cash flow. But this is more fundamental. This is saying there's something wrong with the wells. And I don't know if the wells are worse or if it's just hard to get crews to frack the wells or if there isn't enough frack sand. I, you know, I don't know what the problem is. I'm just showing you the results of whatever those problems are. Right. So now we get to something that, you know, maybe is more relevant to, you know, to rebel capitalists, and that's inflation. And the blue is U.S. inflation. So we're at seven and a half percent as of January, and we'll get February in another week or so. The gold or the orange is the price of oil. This is U.S. oil, West Texas Intermediate, WTI. And again, you don't have to do a cross plot of this thing to see that certainly since 2014, I mean, the correlation between inflation rate and oil price, pretty damn good. I mean, mm. It's real good, in fact. Now, I'm not saying that, that the price of oil is the only cause of inflation, but think about it. I mean, you, you need energy. To, to get stuff to manufacture, you need energy to, you know, to, to transport it, to distribute it, to make it, to sell it. To, and so if your underlying cost of energy, you got to heat your, your, your place of business, you got to drive it. If the underlying cost of energy goes up a whole lot, then your cost of business goes up. And if your cost of business goes up, inflation goes up. And that's, that, that's all I'm trying to say here. It's, it seems like a no-brainer to me. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, printing money and, you know, interest rates. I mean, all of that matters, too. But if you just had to say, you know, well, like, what, you know, for, for, for dummies, what's the main cause of inflation? I'd say it's energy costs. Yeah. Now, this is a, you know... Don't get confused by this too much, but basically this just shows oil price in red, and it shows that it correlates in an inverse or negative way which, with how much oil we have in storage. That, that's all this shows. Mm -hmm. So the gold means we don't have enough oil stored away, and the blue says we got more than we need. And, and so the point of all this is, is that if you want to know why oil prices are high, it's because our savings account is getting real low. And if you want to know why the oil prices get real low, it's because we got so much money in our savings account or oil savings account that nobody's too worried about it. And so right now, we're at a deficit in our oil savings account that is at least as great as it's been since the 1990s, which is when people started keeping track of all this stuff. So or I would assume that this that this large surplus in 2016 17 was a result of shale. Uh, with prices at 110 is it a possibility that shale could maybe bail us out again and turn that uh, deficit into a surplus or what would be the issue is this the issue with this because the issue. they're not the wells aren't as good and the companies right. you're saying uh-uh, we're not going to do that again because when we produced all that oil, we gave lousy returns to our investors and they bailed on us. Right, right. So part of the reason shale isn't going to save us is because of us. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't want you to answer the question, but I mean, you know, how many oil company stocks are in your portfolio? I'll tell you, there, there's only one in mine <laughs> and I'm an oil guy. And the reason for that is, is because the returns are still crappy. They're better than they were. But uh, so, yeah, this I, I'll just uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is kind of how it's not kind of this is how I decide if oil is overpriced or underpriced. These are yield curves. OK, they're not they're, they're very similar to bond yield curves, except instead of interest rates and maturities, I'm looking at storage and price mm -hmm. and obviously it's got a you know it's, it's an upside down shape compared to a bond yield but it's it's, it's the same concept and so <laughs> unfortunately say, sometimes it's not <laughs> that's a, well, we might get a version <laughs> in the yield curve pretty soon my friend but yeah, yeah. 
I, I hear you, man. Well, this isn't inverted. This is how it's, it's just inverted. It, it's got the inverse, the mirror image shape of a bond yield curve is all I was saying, George. Yeah, yeah. But, but the point is, is that for some people, they say, oh, well, oil prices is, is, is inflated. It's higher than it should be because of speculators, because of, you know, liars and cheats or, you know, oil cut, whatever. I, I, I look at this and I say, man, there, there is, you know, th- this is actually Brent. Um, you know, there's February right there, and it's smack dab on the yield curve. So, you know, you want to argue that oil price is either too low or too high. You know, maybe I need to go back to school and figure out how to draw a yield curve because that's not what it's telling me. It's telling me the market feels supply urgency and oil is priced accordingly. Mm-hmm. And then before I leave and we talk about this some. Um, I meant, you know, you asked me, is shale going to bail us out? And this is just S&P 500 indices. This is energy, and it's decreased by about 30% since 2014. It's gone up a little bit since prices improved. And this is ESG. You know, this is the warm, fuzzy uh, environmental, social, and governance. And, you know, it's gone through the ceiling. And so this is where people are putting their money and people aren't putting their money here because the performance is bad. But this is what drives the economy. And, and this is, is something else. So, you know, just just kind of and, and, the, and the yellow is, is the ratio of the two. So it's just gone down, down, down. Now, final point, um, climate change. And I'm not here to pound the table about climate change. I'm here to say that. If you ignore reality as an investor, you're screwed. And I know an awful lot of people in my business and a lot of investors that have just decided based on, you know, no expertise of their own, that all this climate change is a hoax, not real. And, you know, climate change all the time. It's natural, blah, 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 blah. So. I, I read uh, Steve Coonan's book called Unsettled, and this has gotten you know a lot of a lot of, a lot of people have read it. Coonan is a you know he's a physics professor. He was in the Obama administration. Maybe that's a you know a negative. I don't know, but uh, but he was an undersecretary of energy, and you know and he's published this book that you know that a lot of people have read that basically says don't worry about it. Well, you know this is. This is Steve Coonan's graph of, of annual Greenland ice loss. Okay, so if, if temperatures are increasing, we should be losing more ice. And his point is, well, you know, it, 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 it goes up, it goes down, and, and, you know, it went up a lot, but now it's actually going down. And so, you know, the people that say this is due to climate change, they're just, you know, they're just blowing smoke. Well, I got the data and, and recreated his graph here in blue. I'm actually showing the, the real data. The, by the way, he does a 10-year average, which is statistically suspect on annual data, but that's another issue. And then I, I just said, okay, well, you know, since 1900, which is his graph beginning, how much cumulative ice has been lost? And the answer is 15 trillion cubic meters. All right. You know, we don't need to do a, a, a you know, a, a school exercise and how much a cubic meter is. 15 trillion cubic meters is a great big number. You can argue all day and all night about the cycles and how it doesn't matter. All we're telling you is we've lost a ton of ice since 1900 and you just can't make that go away. And then this is his graph of CO2 concentration, which he says, you see, CO2 level is just about at the lowest it's ever been on planet Earth. I mean, this is 600 million years. So he's comparing, you know, what it has been or is to what it was in 1950. So, you know, all this stuff about CO2, it's nonsense. Well, the problem is, is that the scale of his chart Every dot is 40 million years, okay? When did human beings show up on planet Earth as homo sapiens? 300,000 years ago, all right? So everything that we've done is 
you know, consists in a, a, a pinhead of, of, of the final dot above zero. And if you actually say, well, what's happened since the year 2000? Same data, by the way. And compare it to 1950, what you see, I'm sorry, since the year zero, since the birth of Christ, CO2 was, you know, kind of flat. It wasn't really going anywhere. It went up a little bit, you know, in the 13, 14, 1500s, it went down a little bit. Look what it's doing now. 1850, 1900, 1950, 2000. Now, this is the same data. It's just I haven't averaged the data over 40 million years. So, again, you know, I don't want to argue like, what does CO2 mean? And is it a leading indicator? Is it a trailing indicator? Blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying that when you, when you read a book like, like Steve Coonan and you come away saying, oh, it's not a problem, you know, you're, you're, not getting, and you're not getting the story. And so whether CO2 matters or not is, is another story. But the fact that this graph is just hugely misleading, hugely misleading, it's just not even open to questions. So, final slide. Ed Morse, guy who's been around the oil business forever at Citigroup, he says the high oil price is due to all things that happened during the pandemic. Governments are going to have to step in and keep prices under control. I know you love that, George, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's get, let's, let's get the controls. Fed in charge here. Um, the energy transition is going to be a bumpy road. When you get something that's disruptive, it creates fragmentation within countries and fragmentation among countries. So what I'd like to have people remember from this, energy is the economy and oil is the master energy resource. Those who do not understand this will consistently miss investment opportunities. Climate change is real. But an energy blind rush into renewables is not the solution. Those who do not acknowledge this, that climate change is real, will also miss many investment opportunities. So, it's, you know, it, it's not it's not philosophical for me. Mm. <laughs> it's just pragmatic. I mean, you know, get real, acknowledge reality and you'll do better as an investor. Energy transitions are additive. They're not subtractive. There's never been an energy transition where we stop using something. We're using just as much wood today as we used in 1700. It's just as a percentage, it's gone down because now we're using coal and natural gas and oil. We right. didn't stop using wood. Coal use has not gone down. It's gone down as a percentage. People don't understand you don't get off of things. You just don't. We're not going to get off of fossil fuel. It, you know, hopefully it, it, it decreases as a percentage. Humans have never gone from a higher to a lower energy density source, which is to say, you know, those who heard me talk in June in Miami, I mean, oil is by far the most productive energy source we've got. And, and this is the equivalent of suggesting to all the animals out in the savanna of South Africa that they all become vegans. You know, right. we're going to give up meat. It's time to change your diet. It's a good idea for the this is the this is the concept of I go to the hospital and I've got some horrible disease and they say, but we've got it. We've got a solution. We're going to try a surgery that's never been done before. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, we're trying to do something that's never been done before, so there's risk. What I'd like everybody to bear in mind as they sort through all the, the noise is there just is no clear way forward that includes sustaining current levels of energy use and economic growth and solving our climate problems. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, George. Yeah, this, you know what I love when I talk to you, Art, is you always make me think. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. And I, I enjoy it thoroughly. Obviously, I'm kind of left thinking, what, what's the path forward? If you've got a problem with uh, climate change, let's just assume for a moment that that is uh, the case. And, and even if there's not, you know, who likes breathing clean, uh, 
or bad air. I mean, I, that's kind of what I always go back to is that, you know, do we, well, let's just say it's not affecting the, the climate. Okay. Well, do we not want clean air? <laughs> We'd still want it, you know? So, but right. let's just, uh, so then, but see, the, obviously the catch 22 there is that if you move to something where we're not impacting or where we're impacting the climate less, let's put it that way, then GDP growth goes down, then people die. Uh, right. that, that's just the bottom line here. We don't like to look at it in those terms, but especially in poor nations, uh, the people, the, 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 especially the poor, uh, they get disproportionately affected. Uh, you're going to have massive debt. You're going to have literally millions, if not billions of people die if you were to make this transition too uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, we've never gone backwards as far as the density of the uh, energy source we're using. So if you had to just wave a magic wand, if we had to really stick the landing here, I, I would assume it's something where you have to do, you have to do this incrementally very, very carefully understanding that there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And it, it, am, I, am I kind of going down the right path? And I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought. So, I mean, how would you stick the landing? Well, first of all, to use your analogy, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time in helicopters since I'm a geologist and uh, this is a downwind landing, okay? I mean, you don't, pilots don't like to do that. <laughs> They don't like to land with the wind behind them, okay? Huh. Um, and landing, landing at high elevations where the air density is low is always a risk. Oh, I know. That. You just don't have the air density that you need. So, so before we, before I try to answer your question, I'm, I got to say this is really risky. Any way we do it is going to be risky, okay? Um, so, what can we do? First of all, when you hear anybody say that they, oh, you know, there's some great new technology that's going to fix this, um, you know, uh, turn off that channel. Um, that, that's BS, okay? I mean, whatever that guy is talking about is not real today. Uh, by the time it, you know, it, 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 it passes its pilot test and gets upscaled and gets commercialized and gets adopted. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So anybody who, who, who thinks the technology is going to save us, I think needs to get a new life. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I love technology. I wouldn't be a scientist if I didn't, but it's not going to save us. We got it. We got to deal with what we got. Okay. So is the, so, the answer consumption, lowering consumption? I mean, that's a, that's a bad path, too. Yeah, that's like trying to convince lions to go on a diet. Um, Maybe you're going to kill a lot of not, lions that way. Well, they they just don't understand what you're talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, they go out and kill an impala, and and you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, you know, why don't you save some of the impala? You know, only eat a third of the impala, and he's going to say, wait a minute, if I don't eat this, then some hyena is going to get it. I mean, I got to eat it because I killed it. Um, so what we can do is natural gas is a whole lot better, a whole lot cleaner than coal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's arguments all over the map, you know, that, well, we got a lot of methane leakage from coal and blah, blah, blah. But bottom line, it's a lot cleaner. So we need to stop using coal as much as we can and start using natural gas as much as we can. To your point, poor countries are going to have a much harder time doing this. Okay. but I mean, I just drove up and back from Austin this weekend to visit my grandchildren and my oldest son and daughter-in-law. You know, I passed two gigantic belching coal plants along the way. All right. You know, I mean, the counties I drove through in Texas are not poor counties. Um, the United States can afford to make an aggressive transition from coal to natural gas. Uh, Botswana, not so much. Um, but so, so that's that. That's one thing we can do. We also need to stop uh, following false flags. Okay, I mean the idea that we're going to make a difference at all by all driving electric vehicles is total nonsense. It's pure marketing. Okay, that that 
that we're only talking about, you know, like 15% of emissions come from internal combustion engine cars. Now, transportation overall is huge because we're talking shipping and trains and trucks and all of that. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, 15% is 15%. I mean, it's a whole lot better than 0%. I'm just trying to say that it's, you know, it's a little bitty part of a much bigger problem. You know, uh, you know, stop using plastic straws. I mean, okay, fine, do it if it makes you feel better. But don't think you're making a difference in the world. I mean, we got, we've got to start, we've got to attack the big stuff if, if we want to make a difference. And you're right, George. Consumption is the key. That the, the only way that we're going to substantially reduce emissions is by using less and yes we can use it cleaner better more efficiently etc etc insulate buildings that's the number one thing we can do we waste so much damn energy with our poorly insulated commercial buildings okay but none of this is going to happen very quickly the other thing i'd love for people to understand is that electric power i mean we talk about renewables we talk about nuclear. We talk about that isn't good for anything except electric power. And don't get me wrong. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking to each other thanks to electric power. It's important, but it's only a small piece. I mean, the truth is that if you take electric power and subtract all the energy losses, and they're huge from generation, transmission, and distribution, Electric power only accounts for 20% of the energy used in the world. So you can go to 100% renewable tomorrow if somehow we could figure out how to do that. And you've only solved 20% of the problem. So this is what human beings do. You know, we've all taken classes, you know, from Covey or, you know, Wharton or whatever that, it says, well, you know, you, you need to prioritize what's important. You do your A's, your B's, and your C's. And typically what we do is we take care of the C's because they're easier to handle. And we get all done with taking care of the little stuff. And we feel so much better, except that the A's and the B's, the big stuff, still haven't been approached. And so what I'm trying to say is that by driving electric cars and by, you know, not using plastic straws and things like that, we're solving our C problems, which doesn't mean they don't need to be solved. It's just they're not the big stuff that matters. Yeah. So if, if you want continued economic growth, um, I can't tell you how we're going to solve that. Yes, yeah, and, and to your point also about people, George, this is really important. I showed a slide in Miami that if you, if you take all the, the non- fossil energy that we have in the world today, it can only support about 3 billion people. Yeah. We got eight in the world. If you get really aggressive and say, well, maybe we can double it, you know, maybe we can get it to, you know, maybe we can double that. That means that we got 3 billion people that need to die. Okay. And we're talking about 2050 and the population projections for 2050 about 10 billion. Yeah. So what we're talking about here isn't, it, it's not theological, it's not philosophical. We're talking about, you know, real people's living or dying. And, and we simply do not have, we cannot get there from here with renewable energy. And I'm all for it. I'm 100% for renewable energy. I'm just being honest. We cannot support the population we have on renewable energy. We don't add it. I mean, this goes into like World Economic Forum stuff, because then what you're talking about is either reducing consumption or reducing the population. Uh, or both. <laughs> yeah. So my, 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 my point there is, uh, okay, so we, we, we take the reducing the population off the table uh, for obvious reasons. Now we've got consumption. When I try to think this through as an amateur i say okay if we consume less that means less economic activity as to your point uh, energy is the economy therefore you're doing things like increasing the unemployment rate 
Uh, if you increase the unemployment rate, there's more poverty. If there's more poverty, uh, more people die, especially at the low end of the economic totem pole, not just globally, but in the United States, uh, in Europe. I mean, we've seen energy prices in Europe skyrocket to the point where uh, many and even countries like Germany uh, can't afford to heat their house. Uh, therefore, those people risk death. Uh, so we've got something in front of us. If we're doing a cost benefit analysis, we, we've got the cost is known and it's right in front of us. When we look at the, the climate change, you, you showed that chart of the, uh, the ice melting and how on a cumulative level, uh, it's, I think it was 1.5 tons, uh, which- 15 trillion is cubic meters. A 15, okay, I'm sorry, 15 trillion cubic meters. Metric tons, uh, I can't remember which- uh, Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. That's the bottom line. Um, yeah. that, that's also a, a, a negative, that is a risk that is a, a, a cost, if you will, but it's an, it, to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's an unknown. So yeah. it, it, and it's an unknown and it's to what degree will that impact the population? Um, and so you're, you're, you're saying, okay, you've got two really, really, really bad choices. Uh, you've got one where there is a known negative impact and one where there is an unknown negative impact. Is it prudent to err on the side of uh, opting for the unknown negative impact instead of the known? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question and something I, I think about a lot. And, and, and to rephrase what you said and, you know, in, in kind of my language, um, everything about what we're talking about here is going to happen in the future, whether it's climate change, energy, price, whatever. I mean, we, we're trying to we're trying to to look a little bit into the future based on what we know about the present. And so everything that I've 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 told you, I mean, I've presented facts. I mean, right. Facts are true, but but where we take them, you know, even into next year, as you have said, is an unknown. And so I think what you're really saying, again, to translate into my way of thinking, is, is it worth the known risk, the economic and human risk, suffering risk, of embarking on something as radical as it would take by whatever, you know, whatever range of solutions? Is it worth it? And the answer is, as always, I don't know, George. <laughs> right. um, the answer is, I could argue either way. I could, you know, I, I could, I could convince myself it's absolutely not worth it. Let's just carry on. Or if we carry on, it's going to be even. But we don't know. That's your point, and I 100% agree with you. Here's what I think the the present is telling us. I showed a bunch of slides at the beginning. All right, the price of natural gas has gone up fivefold. Price of coal has gone up ninefold. The price of crude oil has gone up, you know, fourfold or something like that. And so, nature or, or or natural systems have a way of providing a check and balance on bad human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so, we can argue all we want about what's going to happen. But what is happening is that energy and everything else has gotten a whole lot more expensive just since we talked last, right? Yeah. And at some point, everybody makes choices based on what they can afford. And because oil, and you know, will it stay at 110 or 115? You know, I don't know, because that's in the future too. But I, I, it isn't going back to 40. I'm pretty sure about that, at least not you know, anytime soon. And so for those people, and you know this, um, I mean, there was a, you know, a, it was a, you got to, you know, end the Fed, but I mean, the, the Fed did a, did a study of, you know, like how much money most Americans have in the bank yeah. a couple of years ago. And, you know, okay, so the average American's got 400 bucks in his savings account. Right. Um, okay, that guy, and that's, I can't remember, what, 50, 60% of, of us, 
has 400 bucks in the savings account. Um, right now, that guy is driving his pickup truck a whole lot less than he was six months ago because the price of gas is higher. Hmm. All right. Nobody told him to do that. It's not ideological. You know, Trump didn't tell him. Biden didn't tell him. He's making that decision based on what it costs him to fill up his tank. Right. And people are keeping their thermostats at a different level because they know how expensive it is to be as warm or as cool as they like. This is what human beings do. This is how we respond to to changes in abundance. And so my guess is we're going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. It may not be pretty, but I'm sure not waiting for government to figure it out for me because they always screw it up. Uh, everybody wants to blame the government and everybody wants the government to solve their problem. I got news for you, for them, not you, that on energy, I mean, there isn't one person that I know of in government, certainly in the United States, who isn't an energy moron. I mean, you know, this is complicated stuff. And I, I really do appreciate you being willing to, you know, to have me on your show more than once. To show this stuff, because I mean, you know, I wish I could make it simple, but it's not simple. It's complicated. Politicians, government people, they like simple stuff. Right. Give me three talking points, you know, and if it's too complicated, I'm not going to talk about it. It's exactly what we're seeing with Ukraine and Russia right now. There is a simple, simple bumper sticker type of uh, solutions to incredibly complex questions and problems. And, and it's been going on for, you know, since the 1300s and, and, and what's going on between Russia and us and everybody else. I mean, this has been going, this is what the, what the British used to call the great game. I mean, this started in the early 1800s where, where basically Germany, and I'm sorry, England was trying to contain czarist Russia so that they could protect their trade routes to India. Right. That's why they got into Afghanistan and Turkey and all these kind of places. You know, this is nothing new. I mean, this right. has been going on for a long time and and it's hugely complicated and we're not going to solve it the, you know, based on some simplistic ideology. But but back to where I was, um, whenever and whenever government gets involved in what I know about, which is energy, whenever they pick winners and losers, the public loses. The public is the big loser. And so I think that 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 affordability, interest rates, inflation, the cost of w- w- people are going to figure out what to do. Now, I wish I could tell you that nobody dies or that it has a pretty outcome, but it, it, it's going to resolve itself. And, and the worst thing that could happen is that we get involved in some nuclear war over something like Ukraine. And then, well, I guess the problem solved. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that, you know, honestly, that's what I, I see all these people on television saying, well, you know, we're going to teach Putin a lesson. You know, he can't have another. Well, OK, but, you know, is a nuclear disaster, um, you know, it, it, just just to your point of, well, do we do we sacrifice economic well-being for climate change? Well, you know, at some point you got to you got to decide how far am I willing to go? Yeah, and I, you know, I, I feel for Ukrainians as much as anybody, all people, but you know, that's the saber rattling is not very helpful. It, it's simplistic. Just to, yeah. to, I, I could not agree, could not agree more. Uh, or I've taken a lot of flack, as you probably know, on Twitter the last few days for trying to calm people down and and say, hey, we we this is a bad situation. We want to feel sympathy. Uh, we want to show support, but we also don't want to get overly emotional. And we we, we got to uh, keep our wits about us because we might have to make some very difficult decisions uh, in the very near future. Going going back to what you're saying about oil and the price, uh, basically free market, uh, the price mechanism curtailing uh, consumption, which if we do it gradually and slowly, may be part of the solution. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind there is this is why it's so important to have price discovery, free market price discovery. Because if the politicians come in and start meddling to your point and start with price control, start tr- 
trying to bring down artificially the price of oil, then this natural uh, containment of consumption uh, won't be there. And it, it's almost like, I hate to get too woo woo about it, but it's almost like the, you know mother nature telling us, hey, we've got to slow down here a little bit. And as a result, the prices of stuff is going up, therefore consumption demand goes down. And then the politicians coming in and trying to muck it up and then like they usually do causing more problems than we had to, be, to begin with. So I think the very first thing is we've got to at, at all costs, try to make sure that politicians stay at it. So we do get that true price discovery and those, those price signals uh, that are so necessary. And then my other main takeaway is, is we just, I mean, the main thing with what we're doing here is we've just got to have these discussions we've just we've just got to have these discussions and we can't uh stay in our echo chamber and i know especially on social media and today people like they, they just love confirmation bias so they seek it out because it makes them feel good and it makes them feel as though well i'm right and i just want to talk to other people that confirm me believing that i'm right and th this is the opposite of what we should be doing right now. And I don't wanna get into my whole sermon on, on the dangers of censoring uh, you know, speech or censoring opinions, censoring dissenting views, but uh, boy, we, we gotta have these open conversations with everyone, not just the people you agree with. Well, uh, you know, George, I, every time I put together a slide deck, like the one I did for us today, when I start gathering slides together, I think I know what I want to say, and what, I, what my point is. And by the time I you know, look at all of those graphs and update them, I always say, wait a minute, I can't say that. That's no longer true. Information has changed. And the way that I aggregate it now causes me to look at it. I, I've never in my life written a post or an article or put together a slide deck where what I thought was going to be the main point in the beginning is what I ended up with in the end. Right. And so, and I am not by any means even close to perfect at avoiding confirmation bias, but I catch myself all the time, you know, making up some graph and I say, you know, that doesn't really make my point. Maybe I shouldn't show that. Well, yeah, maybe I should, because the fact that I don't really have a hundred percent clear vision of what's going on is part of what you deserve to know about what yeah, right. showing you. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to tell you to the extent that I'm capable of being honest, what I know and what I think. And, and there is a big difference. What, what I guess I encounter, you know, similarly, and by the way, I very much appreciate the comments you've been making on Twitter here the last couple of days, not just because I agree, because somebody has to has to point out, and I've been posting things too. I've been saying, look, you know, here, here, here's the, the the real nuclear option in Ukraine. You know, how do you like that? I mean, yeah. Is that really something you want to do right now? I mean, but but I guess the main point I'm making is that everybody's a damn expert today because we all can, you know, click and Google and 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 and. I mean, I get so many people who have absolutely no experience in oil, gas, or energy. They say, oh, you know, you're full of it. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, maybe not, but what exactly do you know? <laughs> Where did you get your counter arguments? You know, you got them. I mean, did you get them from, from Steve Coonan? I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, the, I, I guess... What I'm agreeing with you on is we have to try to watch things, hear things that are uncomfortable so that we at least expose ourselves to that as a possibility. And in the end, if you know, if you disagree with, with what I conclude, but you've listened to me, you've heard me, then I've done what I can. And, and maybe I think, you know, well, you're making a bad decision here, George, because you don't agree with me. But. The fact that at least you heard me or I heard you and, it, you know, it somehow went into the calculation as to how you move forward. That's really all we can hope for.
Absolutely. And I, and I guess the you know the other thing is is that everything that that happens in the world, I mean, whether it's you know politics or economy or energy, these are complex systems. They are hugely complex. That's right. And and when anybody proposes something that sounds simple, you know it's wrong. You just know it's wrong because it, it, simple and complex don't mix. They just they just don't mix. And so you know, back in in, in Miami, I showed a slide about uh, how we have islands of of reductionist expertise in a sea of systems ignorance, hmm. and that is. That that is the current situation. I think it's always been that way since the beginning of time. We just have more people who now think they're reductionist experts because they can they can read the internet. Art, I think there is a tremendous value in experience and wisdom. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but when I was born in 1973, my father was 59. Oh, no, I didn't. My father was born in, in uh, 1914, and he flew planes in World War II in the Philippines. In fact, this is, I don't know if you, you, you've seen me many times, and you've probably seen me wear this chain. I never asked. The, these are the actual dog tags that my father wore in World War II. This is not a replica. This is actually, this is literally what my father wore uh, in World War II when he was flying those planes, being shot down three times, by the way, uh, in, in the Philippines. And uh, when he passed away in 2015, uh, they were giving, given to me uh, at the funeral, and I've never taken them off. Uh, so my point there is that I learned a lot from my father's wisdom uh, because he, you know, I got to spend time with him um, when he was in his, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And it, you can imagine what he had lived through from to, uh, 1914 to, you know, 1980 or 1990, something like that, uh, and then going into the 2000s. So having a, a good appreciation uh, for experience and wisdom, I think, is one thing that's helped me uh, maybe have uh, uh, the worldview I do, if, if it's any good at all. So I want to try to tap into your experience and wisdom. You're a little older than I am, just a, a couple of years. So, and, you, and I think you were around during uh, Vietnam. Uh, you yep. were around maybe during the Gulf War. Uh, I, I was there at the Gulf War, but I wasn't that old. So it, 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 it's there. I remember. I remember seeing it on TV very, very well. But I wasn't obviously aware of macroeconomics or geopolitical considerations, anything like that. And then I, I vividly remember Iraq um, and then everything in between. And, and so you've been there, kind of done that, experienced it. Um, how does that compare to what we're seeing today? And, uh, you know, how con concerned should we be about what's happening today or not concerned looking at it through the lens of your experience and wisdom? Hmm. Well, um, I, 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 I hope my, my comments deserve your, those kind words, George, but um, just to be, um, uh, you know, to full disclosure, my, uh, my first degree was in Middle Eastern history before mm -hmm. I became a geologist. So I do have a, a little bit of a, of a different experience certainly with the Middle East, um, not an expert, that's not what I practice any longer. But um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I remember uh, studying for my first midterm geology exam uh, while listening to the radio <laughs> as they read off the draft numbers uh, back in 1968. Wow. I got a lousy number, by the way. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I could have I could have ended up in in Vietnam infantry pretty easily. This what's going on today in Ukraine with Russia and everyone else is is on a different level for me than Iraq. Um, I mean, Iraq was a messy situation. 
um, George W. Bush and the people advising him were uh, Middle East morons, in my opinion. Um, their sense of uh, you know, the so-called neoconservatives, um, they were smart people um, who I could respect you know, for what they knew, but they really didn't know nearly enough to be making the kinds of decisions that they were. I'll, I'll, I'll make an exception for Powell, perhaps. Um, you know, he, he's the guy that I, I think actually studied the situation more than the others. But, but the situation in Iraq was, it didn't really have any potential for going beyond Iraq. I mean, it did destabilize the whole Middle East. It, it ultimately enabled Iran to, to become a whole lot more powerful and influential, which you know you could argue is either good or bad. I think it's bad myself, but you know, that's that, that's me. Um, but the the it didn't have the risk associated with you know with involving. A whole lot more of the world in a in an armed conflict or a nuclear conflict, the way that what's happening today with Russia does. Right. Um, I, I was, you know, I was probably, uh, you know, uh, I remember riding my bike around with one of my neighbors the night of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, back in whenever that was, 1963 or whatever, and. Uh, I, I I clearly remember my friend Scott and I were. You know, we were talking about, you know, do you think we're, we're going to wake up tomorrow? Do you think there's going to be a world tomorrow? I mean, that's where we were. Uh, that was like this. <laughs> um, so, and, and as a student of history, I'm very sensitive to the fact that human beings always think that what's happening right now is much more important and critical than something that happened before. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to prevent myself from I'm trying to prevent myself from falling victim to that. Yeah, yeah. And you're smart to do that. And I'm trying to also. But the reality is, is that we've got a guy running Russia who, for all of his intelligence and uh, experience, pragmatism, um, he's you know, he's outmanned uh, most Western politicians for the last 20 years. Doesn't mean he's a good guy because I don't, don't want to go there. But uh, tactically, he's a lot brighter than, you know, than most of his opposition. Um, but he's also. He's also following, a, you know, a delusion. He, he's waging a war that is so inconsistent with with what happens in modern history. I mean, this is a. You know, this is a 1940s kind of a thing, invading a country. Um, you know, we, we take over countries by social media or something these days. But but my point is, is that, you know, I, nobody knows what that guy's going to do. Nobody knows. Right. He could do anything. And, and we got a bunch of people on our side, whether it's, you know, in our government or in our people here in the United States that are pissed. You know, and they want to do something about this, just like you and I want to do something about breathing cleaner air, but don't want billions of people to die. And the honest truth that we've acknowledged to each other is we don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm not always that confident that the people who have access to the nuclear codes are capable of acknowledging that we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I'd be shocked if, if, if they do uh, know what to do. Um, I, I read a you know kind of a scary story this morning that uh, or was last night actually that there was a uh, there was a nuclear submarine in the waters off of Cuba with nuclear weapons on it that the U.S. Navy was dropping depth charges on. They had no idea it was a nuclear sub. Well, they may have known it was a nuclear sub, but they didn't know that it had nuclear capability. And there were three guys on that sub who all had to agree whether or not to fire a nuclear warhead. And one of them refused to go along, but they were right there. That could have happened. That could have happened and it had nothing to do with Khrushchev or Kennedy or, you know, I mean, this was completely out of the hands of the politicians. This was up to three guys who were being depth charged in, in, the, in the Caribbean. 
And because one guy said no, we didn't have a nuclear holocaust in 1963. Right. The line is that thin. It is that thin. And 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 I don't I'm I'm idealistic enough to to believe that nobody, not Putin, not you know, not Biden, not anybody would intentionally start a nuclear war. But that's a complex system too, isn't it? I mean, all of these warheads and stockpiles and codes and 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 the reason I told the story I just learned about is that's a perfect example. You know, that 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 here's this these three guys underwater that nobody knew about. I didn't know about until a couple of days ago. And 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 the whole thing hinged on them. Right. Wow. So to me, this is I, I, I really hope that cool heads prevail. You know, sometimes the best thing to do when 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 you really don't know what to do is is something close to nothing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's, it's, I think we've given people a lot to think about. I know I, I've got a lot to think about. So uh, as always, Art, I sincerely appreciate your, your time and your experience and your knowledge and your wisdom. And it's just, uh, it's, it's awesome. I, I appreciate you coming on. So uh, for, for the viewers and, and listeners who want to find more of your charts or more of your ideas, uh, I know you're on Twitter, but what, are you still doing your blog? Where, where can they go to check that out? Yeah, artberman.com. There's a, a number of, uh, I mean, some of it is, is, is subscription, obviously, but there's quite a bit of free stuff on there. I've got a free post on uh, Unsettled, Kunin's book. I've got a, a free blog I just did a week or so ago on uh, why I don't think nuclear uh, energy is, 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 is much of a solution. There, there's quite a bit there. So yeah, artberman.com and yeah, get on to Twitter if you you know if you're following George. Uh, I'm just a step away, you know, at AE Berman 12, and uh, you know I I managed to piss off some people pretty well, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 speaking my truth for whatever it's worth. All right, buddy. Let's never stop having these conversations. I, I love talking to you, George. It's always so much fun, and uh, it's it's always uh, I come away from a thing eh, I hadn't thought about that. Before. And that, that's good for me. So thank you. So do I. All right, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Bye.